Okay, this is the book of Colossians, um, uh, lesson number two in the series. If you notice, we're not giving titles to each of the lessons because this is a, a kind of a, a, a textual study, so the only indication of the lesson is you know, where we're at. So we're in chapter one, uh, just beginning, uh, be going over verses one and two. So last time when we got together uh, for this class, we began with a, a summary of Paul the Apostle's ministry, beginning with his conversion uh, and ending with his death in Rome in um, 67 AD. The idea being if we understood a bit of you know, the history of Paul's uh, ministry, we could, we could more easily uh, put this uh, letter into context. I also mentioned that uh, when he was in prison, uh, in Rome the first time, he wrote several epistles, one of which was the letter to the Colossian church. He wrote this one somewhere around 61 to 63 AD. We also learned that this church, this Colossian church, had probably been established by Paul's associates, Epaphroditus and Timothy, while Paul was in Ephesus for an extended period of time uh, during his third missionary journey uh, again, around 56, 57, 58 AD. Um, I mentioned that Ephesus uh, was near the um, uh, coastline uh, and Colossae was about 100 miles inland. So Paul, while he was in Ephesus, sent out these uh, two evangelists to uh, try to evangelize the area. And it seems that one of the churches that they planted uh, during this time was the church at Colossae. Um, so this congregation, after several years, was running into some doctrinal problems. And while Paul was in prison in Rome, Epaphroditus informs him of a, a, a certain heresy that was raging in this particular place. Now I said that the, the false doctrine was a, a form of higher thought, a higher thought teaching whose proponents said uh, that uh, their teaching was a more elevated form of Christianity, a more elevated form of the gospel. And uh, as I mentioned last time, this new doctrine included various you know, features. For example, the worship of angels, uh, the observance of Jewish laws and certain traditions, uh, the undermining of the apostles' doctrine, uh, these teachers were saying, well, you know, Paul is not much of an apostle. Are we really sure he's an apostle and his teaching? Is it really credible? Uh, you know, perhaps uh, you ought to pay attention to our teaching. We're bringing you something new, something more sophisticated. Th this was the approach. So while he's in Roman prison, Paul sends a letter to these Colossian brethren in an effort to demonstrate the all sufficiency of Jesus Christ and his teachings over the false wisdom being taught to them by these heretics. So in our lesson today, we're going to begin the actual study of the, the epistle uh, itself, the epistle to the Colossians. Notice the very simple outline of this, um, of this epistle. Uh, the salutation, you know, verses one and two, we're going to cover that today. And then the heart, you know, the body of the epistle, uh, all about Christ. Christ preeminent in relationships, Christ preeminent in doctrine, Christ preeminent in ethics, and then finishing his letter with a conclusion and greeting. So the thing that you notice about Colossians is that it is Christ-centered, and it has as its main objective to show that the true teaching about Jesus is the sole response to this and all other heresies in the future. Paul does not take on each point of the heresy. You know, well, let me tell you about angels. These are angels and they, you know, uh, let me tell you about uh, 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 Jewish traditions and how they have no binding. On, you know, he doesn't go into a point by point defense uh, uh, of the gospel against the false teachers. He just presents Christ. He says, here, this is the teaching. Compare what you're learning to this and see which one has you know, power, which one has authority. So we begin chapter one, verses one and two. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. 
So in the first verse, Paul, as was the custom, introduces himself at the beginning of the letter. Okay? And he takes special care uh, to include his uh, title apostle in the introduction. Now we know that the term apostle meant a messenger. That's all it meant. It meant a messenger. He could have said Paul a messenger. And there were many messengers in the church at the time. You know, Phoebe in Romans 16, this woman, she was sent with a message. She traveled with a message. She was a messenger. She was an apostle, okay, a servant. However, only a few could claim the title apostle of Jesus Christ. That was a special term. These were the ones who were the special messengers chosen by Christ Himself. So that's what Paul is establishing, who he is. I'm not just any messenger. I'm an apostle chosen by Jesus Christ. Paul even reinforces this position by saying that his apostleship was not self-appointed, but came about by the will of God. So this introduction was important because what was at stake here was the credibility, not just of the doctrine, but the credibility of the teachers because they were undermining his authority as an apostolic teacher. So Paul is going to go on to give authoritative teaching, so he wants to establish his credentials right from the start. This is not just any message here. This is not just any messenger. This is a messenger chosen by God to send you this message. So it's like, you better pay attention to what I'm saying, because what I'm saying to you comes from God. Now he mentions Timothy, but he does this as a courtesy because the people at Colossae, they knew Timothy, but Paul does not include him as part of the authority base for what he's going to be teaching. Timothy's role is that he is a brother in the Lord and, that, and that's his connection to Paul and the Colossians. You know, I, I'm Paul, I'm the apostle by the will of God. Oh yes, and I'm with Timothy. You know Timothy, he's one of you people and he's with me. Okay? Verse two, in the second verse, Paul recognizes the brethren to whom the letter is sent. He calls them saints and faithful brethren. Um, these are not two separate groups, but simply a reference to the different aspects of the same group. They were saints. The Greek word here meant a holy one or a separated one. Those made holy, how? Well, by the blood of Christ. Those who were separated from sin. How? Well, by the cross of Christ. All Christians are saints, not exceptionally holy or martyrs. You know. we, 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 we see this in, in the Catholic Church, uh, for example. I remember growing up, um, my, uh, my aunt, her favorite saint was Saint Philomena. And she had pictures of Saint Philomena and she had a, ca you know, a calendar with Saint Philomena because she had a, it was a special holiday, you know, special day in the year was for her favorite saint. And then one day, you know, uh, the, um, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church decided, well, you know what, Philomena, she's not really a saint. <laughs> she's not really a saint. So they kind of brought her down a couple of notches. You know, she was venerated, she was important, but she was no longer a saint. They, they, took away the, they took away the special day. You know, my, I remember my aunt being pretty upset with, with all of that. All these years buying the holy pictures and the calendars and everything. You know, poof, all gone up in smoke. Well, I say this to say that in that system, that idea, saints were, had a higher, they were holier than the rest of the people. Uh, miracles were attributed to them. But in the Bible, the word saint simply denotes a person's relationship with God. If you are separated from the world uh, through faith, through obedience to the gospel, you're a saint. Uh, whether you're an elder in the church or a preacher or a Christian that's only been a Christian for a day, all of those people, they're all, they're all saints. And so Paul is um, recognizing them for who they are. They're saints, they're people separated. And then he calls them faithful brethren. This referred to the relationship that all Christians share with one another. So the saints portion is the relationship we have with God. The, bre the uh, faithful brethren, of course, is the relationship we have with, with one another. 
So when one falls away from Christ, for example, and his church, what does that person become? That person becomes an unfaithful brother. Okay? You know, when we discipline or disfellowship someone for unrepented sinfulness or unfaithfulness, we don't condemn them to hell. That's God's call. We don't have that power. We don't have that authority to, to judge a person and say, okay, you're, you're out of here. You're going to, no. No, the only thing that we can identify an individual is that they're unfaithful. This brother has been disciplined. This sister has been disciplined. We've withdrawn fellowship from this individual because of this unrepented sin over here. And what are they now? Well, they're unfaithful brethren. That's what they are until such time as they repent and they can be once again brought back to being faithful again. But we don't get to judge. God does that. He gives us the um, authority and the responsibility to discipline. Okay? Like your children. You discipline your children, right? But they're still your children even if they've done a bad thing. So he then identifies the location and the church where his letter is intended in the first place. But later on in chapter 416, Paul will instruct them to pass this letter along to other churches. And that's the way things were done in the first century. Now, the content was meant for them, but it was applicable to all churches, even until Jesus returns, because the heresies, you know, they might take a different form, but the heresies throughout history always have the same objective. And that is to discredit Jesus Christ as the divine Lord and to discredit His word as the infallible word of God. That's always the end game for any heresy, any other religion. Islam, right? They all say, well, we respect Jesus. He was a great prophet. Well, you know, there have been a lot of prophets. Jeremiah was a great prophet and Isaiah was a great prophet, but they were not the son of God. So they deny his divinity. Uh, within, quote, Christendom, well, Jehovah Witnesses. Yeah, Jesus, sure, he's the Lord, he's the Savior, yes. But when you scratch down and you go deeper into their teaching, you find out that they believe, well, he's a son of God. He, became, he wasn't always a son of God, but then he became the son of God, just like you and I can become a son of God. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches about. In the beginning was what? was the Word. And what happened? Uh, the Word became flesh. Well, I, I don't see where he, he was always God. Okay? So always keep your eyes open for false teaching. The end game all the time, either the Bible is not God's Word or Jesus is not the divine Son of God. That's always the thing that they attack. Um, getting back to our letter, Paul then offers a blessing upon them that he uses in other letters with other words. For example, in Romans 1, 7, does the same thing. He offers them a blessing that only God can provide and one that is very, very precious. Prosperity, health, long life, many children, the respect of other people, all these things are blessings indeed, but grace and peace, these two blessings exceed all of the others. Grace. God's favor, God's gift of forgiveness, God's acceptance regardless of your imperfection, God's promise of eternal life. These are only possible because of God's grace, because of His attitude, because of His kindness and mercy. One thing that Paul does, he, uh, he takes a lot of ideas and he squeezes them down into just like single words. They're like key words, okay? Well, grace is one of those words. When he's talking about grace, he's not just talking about God's attitude, God's mercy, what God has done for us. He's also talking about all the blessings that we receive because of God's grace. And he scrunches those down into a single word. So when he says grace, he means all of that other stuff at the same time. And then he says peace. Well, the felt result of God's grace is peace. Peace of mind, peace within one's soul, peace with other people, peace with oneself, and of course, peace with God. All of the benefits of God's grace. So God's grace are the benefits, and peace are how we feel about those benefits, what, what those things produce in us. So taken together, these two are the very best gifts that God bestows on sinful mankind. 
And Paul mentions that they are indeed gifts that do not come from himself, but from the Father in heaven. In other words, I'm not the, Paul says, I'm not the one, me the apostle, I'm not the one giving you this, God is the one giving you this. Of course, these gifts, grace and peace, they're in marked contrast with what these people at Colossae have been experiencing with their new teachers and their new doctrines. There's a reason why he starts with grace and peace to you. Okay? Because these people here in Colossae, according to Epaphrodite's you know, report, these people are ex experiencing confusion about the way to receive blessings because of the introduction of worship of angels and intermediary spirit beings by these teachers. So they don't have peace, they've got confusion. Paul says that these gifts, grace and peace, come directly from God the Father. He's the one who gives them. So they've not had peace, but rather turmoil and debate within the new doctrines that they've had to deal with. So right away he's saying, so how's it, you know, today we'd say, so how's that working for you? you know, there's this new higher thought, this more sophisticated gospel, How's that working for you? How's that, you know, are you feeling that grace and peace? And within the introduction of Jewish tradition and laws and food restrictions, the concept of grace is probably being trampled as well. Never mind, peace, grace too. You know, Christians, we are restrained by love, not law, right? When we say, well, what, what would the Lord have me do? Well, He would have me act out in love. We don't, we don't say to ourselves, well, what does the law say? Well, you know, how, how close to the edge can I get without sinning? You know, that's not the way we think. What would love do? Right? That's how we think. We're new creatures. We live under the dispensation of grace, not law. It's God's grace and love that not only free us from sin, but also empowers us to overcome sin in our lives. It's amazing. So these Colossians were being dragged back to living under the law by these false teachers. I want to tell you something, and I mentioned this before, every new religion does this in one way or another because that's the only option other than being saved and living by God's grace. There's only two options theologically, only two, grace, law. There's no, other third, there's no third option. There's no third option. Somebody said, well, what about atheism? Well, you're under the law with atheism because you're under the law of the world. Gravity, death, you're still under law. No religion can improve on the gospel of grace. God offering us perfection and salvation based on our faith in Jesus Christ expressed in repentance and baptism. No other religion offers a better deal, if you wish. Nobody can make a better situation, a more effective religious experience. So what do they do? Since they don't go with grace, Christianity is the only one that has grace, they go the other way, which is the law. For example, Eastern religions, they have their rules of life where through human effort you keep trying for perfection one lifetime at a time until you finally reach some sort of oneness with the great above. Well, what is that if it's not law? You know, karma, people say, oh, that's karma. You know, what goes around comes around. Well, what do you think that is? That's law, the principle of law, Islam imposes strict rules. And if Allah wants and feels like it, you might go to paradise, but there's more law keeping, especially social law. Are you kidding me? Why do you, th why do you think their main, their main political and social principle is described as Sharia what? Sharia law. They want to put you know, nations under their law and keep the law. But it's, a, it's a, salvation of, uh, a, a salvation by a system of, of law keeping. Every form of Christian sect or cult has been based on obedience to the rules of a human prophet or leader or a special kind of a doctrinal law. Sabbath keeping for the seven day uh, Adventists. Uh, 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 no bloodletting for the, for the Jehovah Witness. 
These are all law principles. All a form of law keeping to obtain salvation. And it works. You know why? You ever wonder why does this work? I'll tell you why it works. Because people love to try to keep the law. They love to try to keep the law. It appeals to their pride because they can measure their progress in relationship to one another. Salvation by law appeals to our pride. That's why it works. Salvation by grace is such a humbling thing. I mean, it crushes your ego. You can't make it. You're not good enough. You have to humble yourself. What is baptism if not the, 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 symbolically the greatest form of humility? Someone else takes you and buries you. I mean, is there anything symbolically more humbling than that? So the gospel of Christ, on the other hand, declares three simple truths. One, all are sinners. Everybody's a sinner. Everybody is condemned before God, Romans 3, Romans 3, 23. Let me just read the rules and then we'll go through the scriptures, okay? Second thing, nobody can save themselves by law keeping or strategies. And thirdly, salvation is only by grace through faith in Christ. So let's read that, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Can we twist that scripture to mean anything else other than all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Not some have sinned or maybe you can't sin. No, no, everybody's a sinner, right? Let's look at the other one. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Well, yeah, sure, everybody dies. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is the greatest single proof that all have sinned and, and fall short of the glory of God? What is the greatest single proof of that? Well, Romans 6, 23, everybody dies. That's an irrefutable fact. Everybody dies. Well, wait a minute. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the, gospel, you know, the, the glory of God and then everybody dies. The Bible says, well, you know, the reason you die is because you sin and everybody sins. And since everybody dies, these two things complete each other. From Adam to the very last person that will ever exist, all have sinned. Then no one can save themselves by trying to keep Law. No one can save themselves by an attempt at perfectionism in any of its religious or social forms. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 16, what does Paul say? Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Nobody by the works of the law. And then the only way to be saved from the condemnation that awaits us because of our sins is through faith in Jesus Christ and no other. Does the scripture say that? Yes, Acts 4, and there is salvation in no one else. Again, can that be twisted to mean, well, there is salvation in, in, in these other guys, you know, if, you, you know, if, you're very, if you're a sincere Buddhist, or if you blow yourself up as a Muslim, but the scripture says there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven, no other name that has been given among men by which we, we must be saved. You know, very, very specific here. You know, you, people who are not Christians and even some Christians who call themselves, they don't like the exclusive nature of the Bible. The Bible is exclusive. Why? It says that there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. That's a hard thing to swallow. And believe it or not, that's a hard thing to preach. Because if you get out, it's okay here preaching to the choir, but I mean if you get out there and you preach publicly to the public, oh my. You'll have people say, oh the Bible doesn't really say that. Really? Well you read it. You tell me what it says. And then in Galatians 2.16b it says, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified, how? By faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since, the works of, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So the Bible is very specific as to the who, 
Jesus Christ, and very specific as to the how, justification, forgiveness, acceptability, how, based on your faith. So some ask at this point, well, what about repentance and baptism? Where do these fit into all of this? And the answer is that repentance and baptism are the ways that Christ has given us to express our faith in Him. We are saved when we express our faith in Christ Jesus by repentance and baptism. This is what saved by faith not only means, it's what it includes. If you don't believe, then you will express that disbelief how? You will reject repentance and you will reject baptism. I never met a non-believer who was anxious to be baptized. So back to verse number two, Paul says that grace and peace that comes with grace are things that come from the Father. So in his epistle, he's going to show how the Father bestows these through his Son, Jesus Christ. Note also that he says, our Father, meaning the Father of Paul and Timothy and the brethren at Colossae. Let's remember something else that is important. God is the creator of all men, but He is the father of His adopted children, Christians. So when some people out there say, out there outside of Christianity, they say, well God, you know, we have God, He loves all of us. Yes, why? Well, He created all of us. But not all of us can call Him Father. He allows Himself to be called Father by those who obey His Son, Jesus Christ. So all men can call upon God as their creator, yes, but only Christians can call on Him as father or dad, as Paul refers to him in Romans 8.15, using the diminutive daddy. Imagine, daddy. Okay, so that's for, I don't want to get to verse three because the whole thought changes. So there, there's verse one and two. Next lesson, we're going to start on the second section, and that is Christ preeminent in personal relationships. And if you have a mind, I know you're reading through your Bibles you know, for April, but it also helps if you read Colossians chapter 1, 3 to 29. If you just go over that, if you've read it, you'll have a bit of an idea of what it says. All right, that's our class for this morning.